Tonight's Thought Leaders Lecture is a special treat for UTMB. Not only are we sponsoring the lecture, but Dr. Pei Yong Shi, one of UTMB's premier scientists, will join in the discussion of the health challenges related to living and working in space. I am Dr. Alan Barrett, Professor in the Department of Pathology and Director of the City Institute for Vaccine Sciences at UTMB. I'm honoured to welcome you to the November 21 edition of the Thought Leaders Lecture Series. UTMB's Dr. Shi is joined by Dr. Oren Milstein of STEMRAD Radiation Protection and Dr. Sandra Whitmere of NASA Johnson Space Center. The work of these prominent researchers and others around the world allow NASA to consider, investigate and build better processes and products to protect space travelers both today and in the future. Dr. Shi's breakthroughs in vaccine development and infectious disease treatments, Dr. Milstein's work with selective shielding against radiation and treatments for health conditions triggered by radiation exposure, and the work of Dr. Whitmayer on behavioral health and performance is fascinating, and contemplating how the work of these world-renowned scientists have or can impact space travel makes for an intriguing discussion. We hope you enjoy this edition of Thought Leaders as much as we enjoy putting it together for you. Thank you for being with us. Hello, I'm William T. Harris, President and CEO of Space Center Houston, a dynamic science and space exploration learning destination and nonprofit science center. We also have the privilege of serving as the official visitor center for NASA Johnson Space Center. We share the story of human space exploration, past, present, and future, with more than 1.25 million visitors annually from around the world. Thank you for joining Space Center Houston's Thought Leader Series program, Staying Healthy in Extreme Conditions, presented by University of Texas Medical Branch. Our Thought Leader series brings you space and science experts from across the country who provide insights and perspectives on space exploration. Space Center Houston provides robust learning experiences that enable you to be part of NASA's mission. In addition to our extensive collections, we provide new exhibits and live programming, so there's always something new. You can discover how space inspires technological, cultural, and social progress. Also, you can experience our new fall exhibit, Be an Astronaut, now through January 2nd. Space Center Houston's Galaxy Lights, presented by Reliant, returns for its third year. You can see Galaxy Lights transform and illuminate the center with stunning space-themed light installations, watch an incredible kinetic light show, and enjoy some mores by the fire pit to celebrate the holiday season. Galaxy Lights is an immersive holiday lights tradition, bringing guests the most interactive and technologically advanced light display in Texas nightly through January 2nd. You can purchase your advanced tickets online at spacecenterhouston.org. Our Thought Leader series today focuses on how we are keeping astronauts healthy in extreme conditions. The five hazards of human spaceflight are radiation, isolation and confinement, distance from Earth, gravity or lack thereof, and hostile environments. To mitigate these factors, NASA partners with doctors and researchers around the globe, including the doctors at the University of Texas Medical Branch, or UTMB. In today's discussion, we'll answer questions vital to the success of long duration space exploration. We're so excited to have our panel, Thought Leader Series, Staying Healthy in Extreme Conditions, presented by UTMB. Today's panelists include Alexandra Whitmer, Element Scientist for Human Factors and Behavioral Performance at NASA, Dr. Oren Milstein, CEO and Chief Scientific Officer with STEMRAD, and Dr. Pei Yang Shi, UTMB Professor in Molecular Biology. Our first presenter, Sandra Whitmer, serves as the Element Scientist for Human Factors and Behavioral Performance, helping to manage an operationally relevant science portfolio for mitigating risk for future spaceflight. Sandra's background focuses on experimental and occupational health psychology, and she's been part of human, human health and performance since 2006. She's worked in areas related to fatigue management, performance measurement, and behavioral countermeasures. Dr. Milstein co-founded STEMRAD in 2011, shortly after the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in Japan. He's been leading research and development efforts ever since and was appointed CEO in February 2016. Dr. Milstein received his PhD from the Wiseman Institute of Science in the field of immunology. STEMRAD has created a prototype vest for NASA called AstroRAD to protect astronauts from radiation in deep space. Our final presenter is Dr. Shi, who is the John Seeley Distinguished Chair in Innovations and Molecular Biology at University of Texas Medical Branch. He works on RNA virus, drug discovery, and vaccine research. 
His unique expertise in public health laboratory work at York State Department of Health, pharmaceutical companies such as Novartis and Bristol Myers Squibb, and academia at UTMB and Yale allows him to work on both basic and translational research. Welcome to all of you. Our panelists will now each provide more information about their backgrounds and the scope of their work, then we'll launch into our conversation. We'll begin with Sandra Whitmer. Sandra. Great, thank you William for the introduction and thank you everyone for joining today. Um, I'll be talking about the NASA Human Research Program and elaborating a little bit more on the hazards of human spaceflight. So many of us are, are tracking um, what is NASA's next thing, right? We, we're still supporting missions to the International Space Station. It's been exciting to have commercial partners. And now we're gearing up for Artemis missions back to the moon. And of course, um, a big purpose behind these missions is to really get us in route for Mars. We're focused on those Mars mission. And in the NASA Human Research Program, we think about Mars as the ultimate goal. And we sponsor and support research that is going to help protect human health and performance um, on a mission to Mars. And we're also looking at our research portfolio to think about what deliverables do we have? What research products do we have that can help enable now the Artemis missions? And also how can we continue to conduct uh, research during Artemis to help inform future missions to Mars? And so William mentioned the five hazards of uh, human spaceflight of long duration exploration. And those again are altered gravity, space radiation, isolation and confinement, distance from Earth and hostile close environment. And so we'll step through each of these in a little bit more detail. So relative to altered gravity, when we think about a mission to Mars, crew members will be um, in transit to their destination for about six months. So six months in zero G or weightlessness. and then there'll be a, a period of time, most likely around 18 months to two years, where they're now on the surface of Mars, um, living and working in gravity that's about three eighths of Earth's gravity. So we've transitioned from a zero G now to partial gravity. And then on their return back to Earth, um, they'll be back in that uh, weightlessness in zero G. And so a lot of the research um, that uh, we do is trying to help understand what are the risks associated with prolonged uh, time and weightlessness. And so of course, our, our best venue for that is the International Space Station. And what we've learned to date is that prolonged stays in weightlessness can lead to things like reduced uh, bone and muscle mass. And then those gravitational transitions, um, like we will experience on a Mars mission, can pose risk to performance. Um, so we see changes in things like fine motor performance once crew have transitioned from uh, a prolonged stay uh, in zero G back down to Earth's gravity. So we're looking at uh, conducting research on the ISS and also in platforms like you see here in, in head down bed rest. That's the Envy Hub facility that we partner with in Cologne, Germany to understand what devices can, can we use or what countermeasures can we have for the crew to help with these changes. So we're looking at things like exercise, nutritional supplements, and then uh, feedback in devices such as um, haptic feedback or even changing displays to really respond to those changes caused by altered gravity. And this is going to become especially important when we think about Mars, we think about crew members that have spent six months in transit in weightlessness and then land on the surface of Mars. If there's an emergency that needs to happen, they're going to have to operate on their own. There won't be people coming there to greet them, to help them, of course, on the Mars surface. So we are thinking about relative to Mars, uh, what are the risks associated with ultra gravity and what do we need to do to mitigate those risks? So another hazard is distance from Earth. And so Mars, a Mars mission um, is going to take us further than we've ever been. Mars on average is about 140 million miles from Earth, and that will impede new stressors in these missions, such as communication delays of about 19 minutes each way. That means if mission control has a question for the crew member in these uh, types of distances, will be close to 40 minutes before they get a response. And so this is shifting how we support missions. Um, the space station and, and other space vehicles to date are very, um, they're, they're designed to be dependent and to have this interplay between mission control and the crew member in space flight. So this, this new territory of going to these extreme distances is going to shift how we do operations. Crews in these missions will become increasingly independent or increasingly autonomous. 
They'll not be able to return if an emergency occurs. They're going to have limited resupply. And we know from research that communication delays can lead to things like confusion and, and potential performance changes. So countermeasures that we're working on and testing include software solutions to aid with uh, crew ground interactions, more just-in-time training, um, just because the crews will have to deal with emergencies in the moment and with less dependencies from the ground, and then just communication guidelines and protocols. Relative to isolation and confinement, so this is our primary stressor in the human factors and behavioral element with in NASA HRP. And so while we know that astronauts go through a rigorous selection process and that they're gonna train extensively and they'll be supported throughout their mission, um, they're still going to live in a small space for a very prolonged period, separated from uh, their loved ones from home. They're, they'll deal with periods of heavy workloads, shifting schedules, periods of monotony, and then just you know the daily living of being with the same three, four, five people for a period of you know, two and a half to three years. I think many of us can, this might resonate more with us now, having been through COVID, right, and having been through periods of quarantine and, and being home a lot more, what a toll this level of isolation can take. And we know from research in these types of extreme environments, such as the Human Exploration Research Analog, or the HERA at NASA Johnson Space Center, and in Antarctic missions, that prolonged isolation and confinement can lead to dampening of things like positive mood, positive affect, reduced activity levels, and increased stress. Again, something else that, that many of us can relate to um, having gone through the past couple of years. So countermeasures that we're looking at is how can we enhance social support given the tremendous distance, the tremendous isolation, the breakdown in communication with home, and how can we provide things for sensory enrichment? So plant systems such as you see here, such as a veggie system that is now being tested on ISS. And then another hazard, hostile closed environment. So we know astronauts will live and work in the same closed ecosystem inside of the vehicle going to be recycled oxygen, water, carbon dioxide, and minimal flexibility with things like temperature, lighting, noise, um, and habitable volume and layout. So what do we see in these closed types of systems? And some of that is immune changes, and we'll be hearing more today on, um, on the immune system. And also sleep and food consumption changes can be effective as we're very limited in the type of crew quarters, the type of sleeping arrangements, and the type of volume or the type of food that can be brought up given the limited volume that crews will have. The countermeasures that we're working on right now, the evidence-driven recommendations for the habitat, such as lighting systems that can mimic a day-night cycle, and recommendations to really optimize the food choices to ensure optimal nutrition and acceptability given all of the limitations that the crews will face. And then our last hazard to talk about today, which we'll hear more about in our next talk, space radiation. And so as we'll be hearing about radiation exposure on a mission to Mars is going to be more extensive and more profound than radiation exposure than we have experienced here on Earth and even in low Earth orbit, owing in part to the unique um, high energy galactic cosmic rays that crews will face. We know that there's increased hazards and we'll hear more about that today, so just increased potential for cancer and deleterious effects on the cardiovascular system and central nervous system. There's research underway, such as at the National Space Radiation Laboratory, to understand what are those permissible dose exposures and acceptable limits for the crew, what are some of the countermeasures that we can be thinking about, which we'll talk more extensively about, and then some early exploration of nutritional and pharmacological interventions as possible mitigations for future crews. And then lastly, I'll just mention some of our forward work in HRP. Um, you know, we talked about each one of these hazards as sort of standalone hazards um, over the past few minutes. But crews on a Mars mission, these will be um, hazards that they will face in their totality at the same time. Um, and so we're trying to understand, are there certain vulnerabilities that happen under exposure to one that make the effects of another even more extreme? So for example, um, if we see alterations um, in the immune system due to the hostile closed environment, will uh, additional uh, stressors brought on by space radiation or isolation and confinement cause an even more profound effect in, in physiology and behavior. And so that's where a lot of the work within HRP is going now and in trying to understand how we can mitigate those changes. And so if you're interested in learning more about what HRP is uh, exploring relative to these, um, to these hazards and, and being part of the community, I just encourage you to check out these links, um, including a little bit more information about human factors and behavioral performance element and also, if you're a researcher interested, interested in partnering with NASA, we have solicitation opportunities available at the link as well. And thank you so much for your time and attention today, and we'll now hear from our next speakers.
Thank you so much, Sandra. My goodness, a lot of challenges to staying healthy in space. And I have so many questions for you. It was a very interesting presentation. Next, we'll hear from Oren. Yeah, thank you, uh, William. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Whitmire, for your excellent uh, presentation. You touched upon uh, radiation. Well, uh, we are a radiation protection uh, company. Uh, I founded uh, STEMRAD uh, some 10 years ago already, and we weren't thinking about space when we were starting our mission to protect people from radiation. We were focused mostly on the nuclear uh, aspects of exposure, uh, which I'll go into detail uh, now uh, as a prelude to my talk about Astrorad. So it all began when I was doing my PhD studies in immunology. So I was on a career path to becoming uh, a professor, if you will, uh, a professional researcher like Dr. Shi that is with us. And uh, that was really uh, my aspiration. During my studies, I worked uh, a lot with radiation models of injury, and I found uh, very interesting insights that I never took to make a product, but rather just was interested in and possibly published a paper or two. So uh, having graduated in 08 with my PhD from the Weizmann Institute, I went on to my postdoctoral uh, studies at the Scripps uh, Research Institute in Lo beautiful La Jolla, San Diego, and I was on my track becoming a specialist in immunology. But then in 2011, March 11th of 2011, everything changed. That's when the, the tsunami struck the coast of Japan and inflicted uh, tremendous uh, damage on the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear complex to the extent that they had multiple uh, meltdowns there. And this was something that uh, I followed closely and I was very disturbed to see that once again, uh, first responders were entering stricken nuclear reactors without any protection from gamma radiation, which is the most dangerous form of radiation here on Earth, the most penetrating. And this uh, struck very close to home as uh, my PhD mentor, my advisor, he was one of the few who were actually dispatched out to Chernobyl to treat the first responders uh, immediately after the event there in 1986. And he found that their bone marrow was really wiped out in their bodies in a pretty selective fashion. And uh, that was some uh, heritage that was instilled in me uh, during my PhD studies that if there was only a way, if there was only a way to protect the bone marrow in the first responders while they're being exposed uh, to radiation. Really the challenge with shielding from gamma radiation has always been they need thick layers of very dense and heavy material uh, to protect the body. And if one attempts to protect all of the body, you're going to wind up with about a ton of material. And that won't work with uh, most uh, first responders, to say the least. So the world uh, was looking for ways to come up with lightweight shielding material, a lot lighter than lead. But still, unfortunately, lead is the lightest material when it comes to blocking uh, photons uh, here on Earth. So really, the world uh, pretty much gave up on personal protection. But that was under... I would say a false premise that the body is uniformly sensitive to radiation. Uh, so I, during my PhD studies, saw that that is not the case, that it was enough uh, for a bone marrow rich organ to be spared from the field of radiation for that animal uh, or human for that matter to recover uh, from exposure, very similar uh, to transplantation. So I was thinking maybe it is possible to provide meaningful benefit through selective shielding with a thick layer of material over a select region of the body. And indeed, uh, looking back on Chernobyl, uh, the UN came out with a conclusion after an exhaustive study that it was the bone marrow failure in the first responders that led to their deaths. And uh, it's pretty striking that you have an organ system that is selectively targeted by radiation. Obviously, radiation is unhealthy to all our organs, but bone marrow, turns out, is by far and away more sensitive than the other organs. So how do you protect bone marrow? How do you selectively shield a tissue that is present in all of our bones and all of our body? Once again, you would wind up with a solution that's just too heavy for the first responder to bear. Well, it turns out that bone marrow is remarkable in the sense that it's able to regenerate itself. It's enough to protect or transplant a small amount of bone marrow for that to recover and regenerate and basically uh, recover your blood forming system uh, after exposure, and we see that in transplantation uh, every day, whereby a healthy donor comes along, 
and he or she does not give all of their bone marrow, not even half of their bone marrow, but a small fraction of their bone marrow, and that is enough to replenish the blood forming system in the irradiated recipient. Uh, and that is a remarkable thing. So I decided I'm going to try to basically capture uh, that miracle of bone marrow, but only in the form of a product that is wearable. What is the problem with uh, resorting to transplantation? The problem is that you're going to have to find uh, a matched donor, and that is going to be very difficult to do in the context of a mass casualty event or space flight far away on Mars. So better protect that while being exposed. And the dramatic thing that I found uh, after founding the company and doing a lot of research with, with our collaborators, that's enough to shield two and a half percent of the body's bone marrow to get complete recovery of blood counts within 30 days. Uh, so we understood that we just need to make a product that would shield uh, just enough bone marrow to recover. And that product is shown here before you. It's the 360 gamma uh, product. Uh, it's a, the first selective shielding ever. So nobody attempted ever to try and protect the whole life of the human being by shielding only a small part uh, of his or her body. And this is what this uh, product does. It protects uh, an area that is very enriched in bone marrow in the body, uh, the hip region, where we have 50% of the body's bone marrow. And that's enough uh, to secure enough bone marrow, even at very high doses of radiation, for the person to be able to recover. And indeed, we find that had this product been available during Chernobyl, uh, most, if not all, of the first responders would have been alive many years after. They'd have a higher likelihood of cancer, but they would survive the acute phase of exposure. So how does this connect to the journey to Mars? So really, that's a, that's a pretty good question that I never thought I would go into this kind of exciting journey, uh, but, but I'm happy to be here. Radiation in space, so that's not something that we discussed so much over the past 50 years, because uh, really it's been 50 years since we sent uh, astronauts into deep space. Uh, those were the Apollo astronauts of the Apollo 17 mission. Since then, we've had space shuttle missions and ISS missions, which are within Earth's magnetic sphere, and they are therefore shielded. So the magnetic sphere is able to repel the charged particles coming in either from the sun or from supernovae in the form of galactic cosmic rays. So that's a great thing for us here on Earth or on the ISS orbit. But what happens when you exit the safe zone, the blue zone you see here on the screen? Well, then you're going to be really uh, exposed to uh, galactic cosmic rays on an ongoing basis uh, and, and most dramatically to uh, abrupt solar particle events that could really inflict harm on the passengers of a, of a vehicle, even if they're inside the vehicle they would receive potentially very high doses of radiation on the way to the moon and to Mars. And indeed, uh, the dose can be uh, around 40 fold of what you're experiencing on ISS, even more than that during a typical uh, solar particle event. That's pretty extreme. So to answer this need, uh, and I saw this need and it was exciting, uh, we joined forces with Lockheed Martin who are building Orion to take people back to the moon and on to Mars uh, for the first time ever. And we just adapted our 360 gamma solution into a solution that's appropriate for crew using different materials. So not using heavy metals, using lightweight uh, materials uh, like uh, polyethylene. They turn out to be the best for blocking uh, those uh, particles because you're not talking about photon radiation, you're talking about particle radiation. It's a different animal altogether. In the absence of, of uh, gravity, we're able to make it even bigger and heavier, but it's important to make sure it's comfortable and ergonomic for the crew. And this is uh, the Astorad on the inside. You can see uh, the selective sh uh, shielding uh, approach of certain organs, the bone marrow first and foremost, but also other organs to try and reduce the likelihood of cancer down the road in those, uh, specifically in those organs that are very prone to, to cancer that is induced by radiation, organs such as the stomach, the intestines, and the breast tissue in, in women. It's very important to make women as safe as men. They are more prone to radiation damage. Uh, this is the product on the outside. Uh, it's basically a product that was co-developed. Our first customer is the Israeli Space Agency, which has been kind enough to provide the two flight articles of this product to the ISS and now very soon to the Artemis missions. So how do we know that it works? So we basically sent it up to ISS and it's been on ISS for a year now for ergonomic studies. Our next big test for the product is on Artemis 1, 
where we're going to be using uh, radiation phantoms uh, produced by the German Aerospace Center to validate the efficacy of the product. Uh, the product is very sophisticated, very advanced uh, as far as the internal architecture, as you can see. Uh, so once we have the data from both of these uh, data sets, we're going to be able to enhance the product, improve it, make it even more convenient, may maybe even more comfortable and um, possibly even more protective to the extent that it will be ready for deployment operationally on the manned missions to the moon and to Mars. And this is uh, how it looks on station, the cupola, a shot that was taken a bit over a year ago. Very proud to have it up there. It happens to be also the first showing of the Israeli flag on station, which is a great thing for me. Uh, very proud about this accomplishment, but it's only the beginning. We're doing that to improve, really improve the solution to make it even better. So being a part of uh, humanity's return to the moon is a great thing. Uh, we're about to have the first human rated vehicle uh, visit the moon since Apollo 17. Uh, to be on that, uh, it's an unmanned mission, but to be on that with a vest, with the mannequins is a great accomplishment and, and it's a great source of pride for our company. And it's going to be a fascinating study. It's going to be a collaboration between NASA, the Israeli Space Agency and the DLR. We're going to have one phantom uh, dressed up with, with the vest, the other undressed, thousands of decimeters. It's going to be the first study of the deep space of radiation deposition in the human body ever. Uh, so we're going to know for the first time what it is like to be a, a human in space as far as the radiation is concerned. Really, so thank you. I'm, I'm looking forward to, uh, to taking any questions uh, as we have here, and it's a very exciting panel to be a part of for sure. Thank you so much. That was absolutely fascinating, and I have to add that Space Center Houston is honored to have an Astro Red Vest on exhibit. Uh, and so you can actually see one in person as part of our Mission to Mars exhibit. Our next speaker is Dr. Shi. Thank you, William. It's a really a great pleasure to be here today with two of the distinguished researchers. Uh, what I'm going to do is to talk about uh, University of Texas Medical Branch innovation in response to the COVID because as we're all living through this pandemic and I think it's very important to discuss how we responded to this. What I'm going to talk about the mRNA vaccine and then we will talk about how our technologies contributed to the rapid development and approval of the first uh, COVID vaccine from Pfizer and BioNTech. As indicated, the mRNA vaccine contains two major components. One is the mRNA itself. The mRNA encodes a gene called the spike gene, which is the protein uh, presented on the surface of the virus. And then this mRNA is encapsulated in the lipid nanoparticles, it's called. And that that is the component of our mRNA vaccine. And then once we vaccinate this vaccine into our cell, our body, and then this mRNA, as indicated here, uh, the spike gene will be translated into protein called the spike protein. And then the spike protein is going to trigger our immune response. And that will include different types of antibodies as indicated here. These antibodies will bind to the upcoming virus and then block it from infecting us. And there are other uh, immunities coming from T cells that also facilitate the protection of the vaccination. So I'm not a coronavirologist by training. Like many of our colleagues, because of the magnitude of the pandemic, we all feel obligated that we need to do something to stop this pandemic. So we decided to switch. I'm used to be a flavy virologist, such as uh, working on the West Nile, Zika, or dengue viruses. So we decided to uh, pivot towards this COVID research. And what we decided to do is to make the reverse genetic system indicated the top box in this slide. What this entitles is it will develop a system that will allow us to make the virus and manipulate the virus on the petri dish in the laboratory. And this is the most important powerful tool as a virologist 
to study the virus because once you have this system, you are able to manipulate anything in the virus. And UTMB developed the first reverse genetic system for this virus and over 300 institutions around the world we share this system with, they're using this uh, system to study uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then this system, as you, I will show you in the next few steps, and that is developed into tools to facilitate the vaccine and the therapeutic development. So once we have this reverse genetic system, as I mentioned, we are able to manipulate it. So the first, one of the first tasks we did is to engineer so-called a reporter gene, as indicated here by a green star. You know, we engineered the green reporter into the virus. So the virus is the authentic like a white tie virus, except when it infects the cell, it turned the cell green. And this is very useful to look at the antiviral activities. And as I showed you in the previous slide, that one of the protective uh, parameter is the antibody activities that block the virus from infecting us. So this system becomes a very powerful that can do high throughput testing of the antibody levels from the individuals who are vaccinated by the vaccine. So the bottom box shows the timeline of how this project developed. So on the February 10th of last year, we received the first viral isolates from our CDC colleagues. And then we use this 42 days later on March 22nd, we've developed this so-called reverse genetic system. And four days later on March 26th, we had the first contact with the Pfizer BioNTech colleagues, and then we started to work together. And then as you can see on November 18th, and uh, we, were very thrilled to see 95% efficacy. And throughout this development of Pfizer's vaccine, and UTMB tested all the phase one, phase two uh, neutralizing antibodies that has submitted to the FDA to enable the approval of this vaccine. So once the vaccine developed, we've heard a lot about the variants, and we've working very closely with Pfizer and BioNTech to monitor how the, effect, how the variants would affect uh, the antibody activities from the vaccine. So we've been systematically following each of these newly emerged variants. As indicated here, what we again coming back to the reverse genetic system, we are able to engineer the so-called the spike protein. This is where the vaccine is encoding. We engineer all the spike proteins uh, from the different variants into the original virus as indicated on the left side. You know, you have a different color spikes and these represent the spikes from different variants. And we can create these viruses and then we study each of these new variants and their ability to be inhibited by the vaccinated antibodies. So in this way, we are able to safeguard our vaccine and to indicate whether there is immune escape of the newly emerged uh, variants. And then this slide shows you our contributions to the booster vaccine strategy. So what I'm showing you here is the antibody levels over the time of the two age groups, one is 18 to 55 years old, and on the left is more senior age group. You can see the antibody levels are indicated uh, by two colors. The green indicates the antibody levels against the Y type virus, and the, the maroon indicates a variant called a beta variant, which is the most problematic one because this reduces the neutralizing antibody the most for this variant, among all the variants so far we've tested. And you can see over the time after two doses of Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine, you can see a gradual drop of the uh, neutralizing antibody. And then for these volunteers, we boosted them for the third dose as indicated here on average is 
8.2 months post the second dose. And then you can see the last two bars that after the boost, uh, there is significant increase of the neutralizing antibodies uh, for both the Y-type virus as well as uh, the variant, the neutralizing antibodies. So these data really provided the scientific evidence to support the booster vaccine strategy. And then at the same time, we also started to work on the therapeutics and through collaboration with UT uh, Health Houston. And we collaborated with Dr. Ji Chang An's lab to start to develop uh, therapeutic antibodies. As we know, uh, as, as it's shown here in panel B, the current therapeutic antibodies is IgG form, as indicated at the top of panel B. And we started to engineer the IgG antibodies to convert it into the IgM format. So a couple of reasons this is very meaningful. First, as you can see in this illustration, there are five times more binding sites in the IgM antibody compared with IgG. So there are five times more places that can grab the virus to block the virus from infecting us. And also, the IgG antibody currently approved, you have to go to the patient has to go to the clinics to have an infusion. But for IgM, we are thinking about because this is a mucosal antibody and that is existing in our respiratory surface or in testing, for example, and we are able to use nasal spray. So we don't have the patient doesn't have to go to the hospitals or clinics to do the treatment, we will be able to administer them at home. So I think that will be logistically well, will be very, very important. So once we converted the IgG to the IgM antibodies, we found that the potency of the antibodies improves by hundreds folds. And also importantly, because of the size of the IgM is much bigger, the virus having a much harder time to to develop resistance. So the IgM antibody currently is active against all the variants so far emerged in nature. So we think this is a very, very important development. And now uh, we're very excited that this technology has been licensed to a company and we're looking forward to move to the uh, phase one clinical trial. That was that absolutely is fascinating. I I'm really excited now to have a conversation with all three of you as we look about staying healthy in space and all of these are such important factors as you prepare to send humans to going back to the moon but also into deeper space but i i do want to, to begin with uh Pei young and ask with the i igm mm -hmm. technology and the igg is that what's being developed and applied in some of the oral treatments that we're beginning to see that are being developed where you would take a series of pills to help reduce the acuity. Is, is that the same technology that's that's being applied or is it different? The oral therapy, these are so-called the small molecule therapy, and those are very small molecules and they formulate it in the way you can take it orally. And then there is another type of therapeutics we call therapeutic antibody or biologics. And specifically right now are uh, used in patient, COVID patient is the IgG antibody, which I showed on the slide. There are only two binding sites on the IgG. And, and then those need to be intravenously uh, uh, administered. So I think it's this is why it is not very popular because you really have to go to the hospitals to, 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 to be treated. And then in the case of these IgM we are developing, we think, and then we think, in the animal model, we've been using just intranasal treatment. So you don't have to, you know, uh, through the veins to get into our blood system. And this we can just directly to spread it into the nostril and that will administer. And I think logistically, as I said, it will be very, very powerful. That is just fascinating. Sandra, I wanted to ask you, when we talk about the five paths of space, we didn't really talk about contagious diseases. And we know humans are living beings, and we're also looking at growing foods in space, which I know we're having a lot of success doing on the ISS and modeling it in that way. Is that something that you're exploring um, for sending astronauts into space? 
kind of management of diseases or, or things that people may have in their, in their bodies and not be diagnosed yet create some type of infection among the crew. Yeah, thanks, William. We actually do have a, a immune group at, at JSC that's um, keeping an eye on that and just trying to understand how to um, protect the crew in the kinds of situations that you just mentioned. Um, there's a, a recent publication that showed in looking at some of the immune responses over the past few years that we see um, an improvement there. We see a little bit less that's manifesting and that's believed to be in part because some of the, the workload tempo and the stress that had been there um, for, for many years has, has uh, slowed down a little bit. So they think that's partially why we're seeing you know, less viral activation and things like that. But it's something that, that is uh, being investigated further um, because again, it goes back to that closed environment um, and the risks that are there for the, the crew uh, going forward. So along this kind of vein of conversation, Oren, I'm curious, uh, does radiation play a role in creating a mutation in disease? Let's say someone has latent measles or something, some other kind of a virus in his or her body, which we do, right? Some, some viruses become an inert over a period of time. Could radiation be a factor in actually causing a mutation or reactivating um, of a virus? Yeah, uh, William, I think that definitely yes. I think it's something we should definitely look into the impact of deep space radiation on pathogens. Uh, obviously, pathogens have been explored on ISS, but in the absence of fierce radiation, I don't think it's informative enough to draw conclusions as far as what we're going to see with regards to mutations within pathogens in general in deep space. Well, I wanted to 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 ask a couple of few questions of you based on some uh, parts of your presentations and beginning with Sandra. I was fascinated by looking at the human modeling in Germany of the, the lowered head research subject. And I'm curious, um, clearly that's a model that works because you're utilizing it. How long does, and that's a volunteer I presume, that is um, the research subject. How long does someone lay prone with his or her head lowered? And what kind of information are you collecting from someone in that type of study? Yeah, thanks, William. So uh, most recently, there was an investigation looking at um, participants in that in that position with a, a drop of uh, six degrees at the head um, for a period of about 60 days. Um, and this is an analog really to understand some of the fluid shifts that we see in weightlessness. So it's a good physiological analog to understand some of the bone changes and muscle changes. Uh, most recently, it's been looked at as a potential platform to understand changes to uh, what we call the um, space flight adaptive neuroocular syndrome. It's where there's changes in um, in the eye that have been seen in space flight. And so there was a recent investigation completed with uh, three groups of participants for a period of 60 days, and they actually tested an artificial gravity uh, countermeasure so a spinning centrifuge um, that participants were in. And so one of the groups was just in head down tilt for that period of 60 days doing a series of, of, of tests. Another group came in, they were in constant um, uh, spinning motion. Um, and then another group had intermittent uh, exposures, I believe about 30 minutes a day to the, the artificial gravity treatment. And just to see if there were some, some benefits there. I can't really speak to from a uh, the neuroocular syndrome point of view, uh, what the results are, I, I, I don't know those yet. I know we our group tested um, potential changes in, in cognition and, and changes just in sort of uh, well-being. Um, we did see that across all three conditions, um, for the most part, people performed fine. There was some slowing on some of the on some of the tests, um, but there is a, a, a measure that we use as part of our cognitive battery um, that looks at emotion recognition. So this is a measure that's been developed by Matthias Basner and colleagues at University of Pennsylvania. And what they found was that across all three conditions, there was um, uh, a slowing in rec recognizing some of the different emotions that are portrayed in, in faces um, over time, um, as well as a, a, a trend of more of a negative bias towards some of the more negative emotions. Um, it was interesting to see this across all three conditions. You know, it told us that the artificial gravity for, for this particular outcome uh, was was not necessarily helpful, but that you know, it's maybe more tied to 
kind of the inherent isolation of being in bed rest, you know, but bed rest participants, it's not really looked at as a typical isolation um, uh, research platform, but really just being in bed for that period of, of 60 days and having limited interactions with, um, with folks uh, it probably was, could have been one of the contributing factors to that and could have taken a toll. Now it isn't the type of isolation per se. It's not a, it's maybe not a great isolation analog because in space flight, we know that they'll be working together as a team. They'll still have um, those connections with the outside world. So even though it's an isolation analog, it, it might be a more extreme isolation than what we expect to see in space flight, but it was still you know, an interesting finding uh, nevertheless. So, so that's the, there have been different um, timelines. Sorry, it's a long answer to your question. Um, there have been some studies that are a little bit shorter in duration, but the, the 60 days is the most recent uh, uh, duration that was tested. I, I think prior, many years ago, there was a 90 day, but there's been some that are 10 days and so forth. That's absolutely fascinating. And I think, could I take two months out of my life, you know, for science and participate in one of those studies? And I, I really am so thankful to all of them for, for helping us advance learning in science and prepare for deep space. It's absolutely fascinating. So I wanted to jump to Oren, and I'm, I'm curious, Oren, about how did you determine that you only needed 2.5% of bone marrow in order for your body to repopulate and, and grow back bone marrow in your body? How, how was that determined? That's a very good question, uh, William. So it's basically, it's based on transplantation studies, uh, whereby uh, you can basically uh, titer the amount of hematopoietic stem cells. So when you transplant bone marrow, what you transplant is the stem cells uh, that produce the progenitors and then produce the, the blood cells uh, themselves. And when uh, you do that, you're able to basically see that you can go down to very small uh, quantities of bone marrow and still have a successful transplantation as measured in the recovery of uh, blood counts uh, over time. Uh, so it's basically something that you can see in animal studies, but also in the human setting, uh, we've seen uh, a very small amount of cord blood, for example. Uh, successfully recover the blood forming system in an adult. Uh, so it's really fascinating that the capability of these stem cells uh, to replenish the blood forming system is remarkable. That's absolutely incredible. I'm absolutely fascinated with the technology and also its applications here on Earth because we do have environments where we're exposed to high levels of radiation. Well, I wanted to, to switch over to Pei Young and, and first say thank you for the research that you're doing and how it's helping us work toward, has helped us work toward a vaccine and hopefully getting back to some more normalcy in, in our lives. And I'm, I'm curious about, uh, it seems to me that this could be, a, again, an architecture that could be used to address many other viruses that affect humans. Um, do you know of any research or is UTMB working on research? Um, to apply this kind of architecture, this technology uh, toward addressing other uh, coronaviruses or other viruses that are afflicting humans? Yes, absolutely, William. And this is the first time for the mRNA vaccine platform to develop something approved for human use in the clinical setting. And that really sets the foundation for its broad application in the future. For example, if we have the next pandemic I'm sure by default, this platform will be used. But of course, there are still a lot of improvement can be done. Uh, for example, at UTMB, we're trying to convert, because mRNA itself is expensive to make and they're very lay by, and you have to keep it very low temperature. And we are trying to make it in the DNA form. That is the DNA, which can be very easily low cost to be produced in the bacteria. And then we can use the DNA inside our cell to produce mRNA. And we can make the mRNA even self-amplifying. So by engineering certain molecules from the different organisms, we can engineer that so that it can amplify itself. And this will be another version of the future platform. But of course, with the approval of this mRNA pla platform for the COVID, and this is not just limited to infectious disease. And this can be used to other indications, for example, uh, the oncology therapy, et cetera, because it can introduce the target proteins you want to our cells. 
and then for the therapeutic purposes. So the application is, is very much unlimited, but of course, we have to be cautious, not everything being used will, will, will be successful, but the possibilities are there. It just needs to be explored for the research and the development. So, so along those, those lines, is it possible that we could develop some kind of architecture or something that could be an at-home kit or something that astronauts would take into space? where you would have, if you will, kind of the, the basic form of a way to engineer a way to respond to a vi an unknown virus. It would probably have to be human uh, or earthbound kind of virus, but is, is that plausible? Is that something that could be theorized? I think theoretically now this makes it possible. As long as we know the sequence of the target therapeutic gene or antigens we want to make the vaccinate for, and we are able to synthesize them with the equipment of the nowadays the synthesis. A synthesizer machine is very robust and we're able to synthesize them. And then if you have formulations, for example, the mRNA platform I showed in the slide, you can mix them too and then you can administer to the body. And in theory, it is possible. But in terms of technical feasibilities, there is still a lot of things to be developed. Wow, it makes me think of Star Trek in many ways, right? Where they kind of sequence something and figure out the right way to treat you. I wanted to go back over to Oren, and I'm very curious if you're able to share this. What is the material that provides the protection from radiation? You know, we have an exhibit here at Space Center Houston where we exhibit the AstroRad, where we have different materials where guests can test um, the, the, the um, quality of providing uh, protection from radiation. And, you know, water is one of the best insulators, but it's extremely heavy and precious and difficult to take into space or build into something. Are you able to say what, what, what is the element that provides this protection from, from radiation? Uh, certainly. So the gold standard uh, for protecting from radiation in space is actually polyethylene. Uh, that's the best kind of material that you're going to use. Uh, it's considered uh, very good as far as blocking those particles coming in from the sun or from supernovae in the sense that it's going to produce very little secondary uh, radiation. It's because the, the nuclei of the hydrogen atoms within the polyethylene, uh, when they interact uh, with uh, nuclei coming in uh, from deep space, then they're basically able to repel those uh, particles without emitting a secondary wave, such as a gamma radiation or an X-ray uh, wave. So that, that happens to be uh, actually a very convenient choice because it's uh, non-toxic, it's inexpensive, and importantly, you can actually utilize onboard plastic waste to produce radiation shielding. And that's something that we're beginning to do. We've actually done that on station uh, two or three months ago where we took that kind of material and we printed it on station, we produced a part of the shielding component of the vest on ISS, uh, utilizing a green process. So I think that's certainly promising for the future that you're able to use an abundant kind of material such as polyethylene. Uh, now that sounds like pretty low tech to use that, but really that what's unique about Astrorad is uh, the selective shielding approach and the fact that it's uh, providing augmented protection in proximity to those very sensitive organs in the body. So it's providing your best bang for your buck as far as protection uh, when you account for the weight savings that this approach offers and also the ergonomic opportunity that it creates, it, it's a game changer. And that's really the IP of the product. Uh, the internal structure, it's less about uh, the, the material per se, which has been established to be polyethylene. You can incrementally improve it using a boron nanotubes, for example, but very incrementally. And we've done a lot of research with Lockheed Martin on this uh, topic. That is absolutely fascinating because I would not think it would be a low cost material. And yes, there is an abundance of polyethylene around, so that, that is absolutely fascinating. Wow. Um, Sandra, I wanted to ask you about um, you know, we all empathize with astronauts now after with the pandemic, right? Living in small spaces or staying home or being isolated from others or not being close to family and friends if they live in other parts of the world or country or even the same city. How do you prepare 
astronauts for long duration isolation and, and being away from family and friends. Is, is there a way that you begin beyond setting expectations? There's always the expectation and there's a reality. How do, what, is there a process that you go through or uh, is, is there part of the training that helps prepare them uh, for long duration isolation? Yeah, great question. And um, so I'm not on the operations side, but I can share a little bit with you with some of the insight that um, um, I may have here. Um, so the, you know, a lot of times crew members come uh, through and they've been with military, they've done deployments, um, they've had other excursions as scientists where, you know, some of them have gone to Antarctica for a time. And so there's a sense of self-selection there in a way where they're coming in through the door already having experienced some of this uh, to some extent. Um, they do train extensively leading up to their missions. A lot of times it's a lot of overseas travel with our international partners, um, time spent in Russia, and that in itself provides um, some, some training for them as well in terms of the separation from home. Um, we do have a family support office that works closely uh, with the, the crews and their families to, to help provide that support. I think overall, uh, it's, it, you know, not to minimize the experience now, I, you know, it's, it's an extensive time to train and an extensive time for the crew members uh, to be gone. Um, but they are able to leverage things like uh, a voice over IP phones and, and real time comm also during the mission to, to stay in touch. But um, th there are some things in place uh, leading up to the mission. I think we're starting to get a handle a little bit more, you know, as we think about what kind of training will they need um, for a Mars mission, which will put the isolation, you know, at a whole new level. And so we do have the, you know, the, the analog research we talked a little bit about earlier. Um, so far, it's, you know, primarily um, uh, part research participants who come in, but there is, you know, there is some thought about once we get the, the crew, the Mars crew that's going to go, you know, should there be uh, um, kind of a trial period ahead of that, not a, but it, an opportunity for them to um, to go to uh, uh, with their the rest of their crew, um, do something like a winter over, um, you know, to help sort of set the expectations, like you were just mentioning, as to what that's going to be like. Um, but for now, the 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 training that they do go through, and I think a lot of them come in already having had these you know long periods of separation. Uh, I think that helps prepare them for sure for, for ISS. Well, you know, now we're in this very interesting period of increased space tourism, right? Where, um, you know, the International Space Station is hopefully going to be extended potentially up to 2030 in low Earth orbit, but we now have two ventures with, well, actually three, because uh, someone, you know, there's a company that's going to be adding on to the ISS and eventually seeding from it. And then there are two other private ventures that have been announced recently. And we know that there is more radiation, right, in the Earth orbit because you're getting kind of farther away from from Earth and and um, more exposure into space. I'm curious, are are any of the private ventures talking to you about protection for these space tourists or people who may be assigned to work on station, who are chemists or engineers or others? You know, a company in the future, uh, maybe we'll be sending Dr. Shi to to work on. Uh, you know, a private space station for a week to conduct research. Is that a consideration? Uh, th that's a huge consideration for a company that's for profit and that is investor driven. When you're talking about the size of the market, uh, then uh, it's crucial to uh, demonstrate that it's not only NASA crew members that would benefit from this, but this is a, a growing industry with space tourism. And, uh, you know, indeed, private scientists are going to be going up. Uh, so the numbers grow dramatically when you address that market. Uh, so to answer your question, I'm happy to answer in, in the affirmative that yes, we are working with uh, the private industry as far as the space tourism goes uh, to enable uh, deep space travel, not only of astronauts, but also of others. Oh, fascinating. Uh, that's a good, that, I was hoping that was the answer. <laughs> so my question would be for uh, Bayong, would you go to the ISS or if you had an opportunity to conduct research uh, on viruses uh, in, in microgravity? Oh, absolutely. And I think this is a very, very fascinating topic. As you already mentioned at early discussions, really when astronauts in space, our physiology change, and with all the radiations we're also talking about, how that affect 
our microorganisms, as we all know, we all have viruses and bacteria in our inside our body. How that is going to trigger the different response and uh, and affect the health of the astronauts? That would be a fascinating topic to to research. I would love to do that. And Sandra, I have to ask you as well because. Uh, you know, you've dedicated your career to understanding humans going into space. Would you go if you had the opportunity to? You know, I wish I could say that I've uh, become resilient and adventurous just by, you know, the work that we get to do. Um, I think I've, I've, you know, seen a lot of the risks and understood a lot of the risks. And um, I don't think I'm, I'm cut out for it, <laughs> but, but I'm all about supporting the crew. You know, I would love to uh, continue down this path of getting to figure out ways that we can really set our crews up for success. So that's where my heart is, is to equip equip the crew. But um, I don't think I'd be doing anyone any favors to be to be one of, the, <laughs> one of the ones that's actually up there. Well, I have to say personally, I'm a major foodie, so I have to be, have really good food on, on wherever we're going for a long period of time for me to be able to, to endure so I'm, I'm curious, you know, NASA's priority right now is Artemis, and that's returning astronauts to the moon. And I'm so excited to hear, Orin, that there are some models of asteroid that will be on the on the, on the the flight that's going no earlier than February 12th. And uh, so we'll learn a lot about exposure, radiation exposure. Uh, but, you know, the plan is to have um, kind of long duration human presence on the South Pole of the moon. You know, we're talking about missions of four to six months. You know, there are missions that are going now to understand, you know, there's frozen water ice on the South Pole of the moon. We're trying to understand, is that potable? Can it be used to grow food? Um, can we have humans there for an extended period of time? There are entrepreneurs who are already thinking about moon hotels, of course, you know, for, for long duration. Um, and you know, this this type of vest you'd have to have on all the time, right? Because you would be outside of Earth's magnetic shield if you're on the on the moon. Is that something that you're exploring um, or having conversations about with NASA? I'm just I'm just curious. Yeah, so, so it's really, uh, William, it has to be reasonable. So you can't inhibit operations completely. Uh, on the one hand, on the other hand, you have to uh, strive for a safe environment. So it's a multitude of solutions. You have the storm shelter uh, solution within Orion, for example, that is very small. You could go in there for an hour or two. I assume the human lander system will also have that. But if you want to be able to continue operations uh, for hours and days outside of that protection, then the vest will be uh, very handy uh, for them, especially within the context of a solar particle event. And will they wear it all the time? It's really up to what the physicians uh, decide is acceptable as a risk. Uh, it's not for me to decide. Uh, I have to make it, my end is to make it as comfortable as I can so that they, they, they'll wear it as much as, as they possibly want to. Uh, so I'm, I'm curious, Sandra, are you exploring this, uh, these questions for long duration, for being, for astronauts being on the surface of the moon, you know, for four months or six months time over the Apollo mission, I think the longest amount of time they were on the surf, lunar surface was maybe a few days, right? It was it was very short. It was really about can we get to the moon and get back? Can we grab some rocks and other samples and then head back to Earth? But it's a really different scenario if you're you're creating a habitat and actually staying on the surface for four to six months. Um, what are what are some of the big questions that you're exploring and preparing humans for remaining on the lunar surface for extended periods of time? Yeah, thanks, William. That's a great question because it really is a unique scenario. Um, you know, one of the things that we mentioned earlier about Mars is you have that prolonged communication delay and just the distance is really going to force this level of autonomy and independence. When we talk lunar missions, it's, it's kind of a different uh, scenario because they're closer to home. They'll have some communication delay, but it, it will not be extensive. It might be in the matter of, of seconds. So one of the things that we think about is, OK, so what's unique to for Artemis and these prolonged periods that we haven't really been thinking about relative to Mars? I think the, the gateway platform and sort of these scenarios where we have some crews that are um, near the moon in cislunar space, working with the crews that are you know, traversing and going to the surface and staying on the surface, adds a whole new dynamic to how we do operations now with mission control, supporting the crews on ISS 
and how we've been thinking about operations for Mars with um, crews being, you know, very, not very, but increasingly independent and, and still trying to work with mission control back home. So that lunar scenario where you now add some of the crew in SUS lunar space with mission control, with the, the crews on the lunar surface is, is a whole different a aspect. Um, and we anticipate also running kind of simulations. You know, it's a, it's a nice stepping stone for us to get to Mars. So once they're established on the moon and then the unique partial gravity, you know, that's another aspect. You know, how do you how do you set up beds there for long periods of time where you can protect the crew from sleeping? Another aspect, too, is I think you were talking about the poles. And I think there we have more along the lines of two weeks of constant light exposure and, and two weeks more of darkness. So that that's that's another scenario for us to think about. And another risk that we have to consider. Um, but how do we you know, ensure that their habitat is going to be optimal? How do we um, um, provide the right food source and just continue to support them? And if we do simulations as that stepping stone to Mars, you know, if we add Comdelay now to this unique uh, platform during prolonged Artemis, how can we leverage that to help us learn so that when we go to Mars, we're a little bit more ready? So we really are uh, excited about the Artemis missions. We're really looking for ways to, to help support those through what the research, the relevant research has been saying all these years, but also what kind of uh, minimal research payloads, you know, to, to Orrin's point about, you know, really trying to make things work within an operational context. Um, we really have to be careful when we talk about, think about what research can we do there. It's within the con within the constraints of what they'll be doing operationally, because that'll, that'll be the priority, but there's so much that we can learn from these scenarios to help us get ready for Mars. So definitely uh, at the forefront of, of much of our discussion. That is just fascinating. Well, Peyong, I'm curious if you could set up a lab to do work on the moon, what are what are some questions that you have? Because uh, of course it would be a uh, an environment where I think there's one sixth gravity on the surface of the moon, right? So it's, a, it's less than Earth's gravity and it's gonna change the characteristics of lots of things. Are there particular questions you would have or like to explore in that altered environment from Earth? Sure. As a virologist, I would particularly be very interested in topics on that, right? And then how that affects even not the animal models. We can start it with the cell cultures and anything we can in the containment that we can bring the spat samples to there and infect with different viruses. And then we're able to check there amplifications and infections, how different uh, that would be in that specific environment compared on Earth. And I think that would be very, very interesting. And also some of the therapeutics, and I think for the astronauts, it might be relevant uh, during their, you know, the long journey to the deep space. And, and those studies to compare the efficacies and etc. in these models will be very, very interesting to prepare human beings moving into the deep space. Uh, you know, I am having such an incredible time speaking with all of you and we're getting close to the, the end of our time together. Um, so I wanted to give you each an opportunity to share kind of one, one thought or insight you'd like to have on staying healthy on Earth. Uh, because we, of course, have your research that's focused on staying healthy as we go into space. But of course, we know that one of the greatest benefits of space exploration is the benefit that has created for humans and our lives here on Earth. And there are thousands of insights that have come from space exploration that improve the quality of our lives and advance scientific research, particularly in the life sciences. So I'm curious if um, you each could maybe share one, one thing that from your research and work as related to space that you feel is a a benefit to humanity or, or would like people to, to focus on and, and maybe we'll begin uh, with Sandra and that's going to be a hard one for you because you have a lot of things that you could say. <laughs> I'm going to cheat a little. Um, you know, I think we are learning just some of the fundamentals um, that we, we come to know here on Earth are so critical in space, but it's easy for us to get away from that. You know, just getting adequate sleep making sure we're eating well. And of course the social support piece, which uh, many of us have lacked over the past couple of years, making sure we stay connected with loved ones um, through these things. I think we see, we, we've learned a lot from space explorers. Um, you know, many of them have shared through COVID um, things like keeping a routine, staying in touch with loved ones. Uh, so for sure, I think we see those as, as critical pieces and we really need to take those seriously and, and prioritize those things uh, in our lives. Great, thank you. How about for you, Oren? 
Yes, yeah, so you know my my focus is uh, pretty much uh, you know on the solutions that we make, and, and I can tell you that uh, the the space product uh, for astronauts, Astorep, has been a tremendous inspiration for creating other solutions, but here on Earth, and one such a solution is our medical solution uh, that is meant to shield doctors in a much better way in the cat lab, while removing the weight from their bodies. Uh, the absence of gravity uh, in space has basically been an inspiration to create a, so to speak, zero gravity uh, here on Earth uh, solution. And that solution is something that is currently being uh, dispatched into hospitals uh, around the world. Uh, so it's providing a better protection while taking the weight, the burden of the weight, off of the bodies uh, of those doctors that are doing tremendous work to save all of us. Fantastic. And how about for you, Dr. Shi? Well, I think right now human beings are experiencing the most challenging pandemics. And I think there is a lot of things we are learning from this and that will help in the future, no matter where we are. And as we know, uh, there are 26 families of viruses just alone that can infect humans. A lot of them, we don't know, you know how bad they could be and because they are just not well studied yet. And I think to prepare us, us for the next pandemic, and we really need to study more on these uh, potential pathogens and then learn from what we are experiencing uh, currently and in the future. So much fun talking with all of you. I want to thank our panelists for a fascinating conversation. And um, I hope that our, our viewers all have enjoyed this conversation. And if you if you did, please go to spacecenter.org where you can track information on our social media front and also check out Space Center Houston's blog to learn more about this topic of staying healthy in extreme conditions. So again, my heartfelt thanks to our panelists and we look forward to seeing you at Space Center Houston where you actually can see the Astrorad on exhibit. Thank you.